in a temple in southern India, the dancers act out a remarkable story. They tell the legend of the death of a holy man, a saint who came from the Middle East, bringing a new and exotic religion to India. Christianity. <laughs> this journey begins thousands of miles from India in the deserts of the East Mediterranean. By the early 7th century, the Christian Roman Empire was beginning to crumble under a wave of attacks. The great classical cities slowly fell into decay. As their libraries and universities were burnt down or destroyed, many of the most important manuscripts were preserved in a remote monastery in the desert of the Sinai Peninsula to try to save them from the shadows of the approaching Dark Ages. The monastery is called St. Catherine's. The great walls of St. Catherine's and its sheer isolation in the rocky desert preserved it from attack for centuries. The monks were able to accumulate one of the greatest collections of icons and illuminated manuscripts in the entire Christian world. For over a thousand years, many of their treasures remained hidden. When the first European travellers began arriving at the monastery in the 19th century, they found a library of unmatched richness, containing lost works by great classical authors and the oldest extant copy of the New Testament. But I had come to see perhaps the strangest discovery of all, a previously unknown early Christian text which had long been suppressed as heretical by the Western Church. The manuscript was entitled, The Acts of St. Thomas. Apopote inne? Inne apoton pento eona. Fifth century. Fifth century. Chilia penda cosa chronia biblio. The Acts of Thomas. One thousand. If hundred years, years old. The manuscript tells the forgotten story of a remarkable missionary journey made all the way to India by one of Jesus' twelve apostles, St. Thomas. It's a story which immediately fascinated me, not least because, unlike most such pious legends, it just could, quite conceivably, be true. From the early church to the modern day, St. Thomas has always had a powerful hold on the religious imagination. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spot. Like losing my religion. He's remembered as Doubting Thomas, the story of how he, alone of the Twelve Apostles, refused to believe in the resurrection until he'd felt Christ's wounds, has been endlessly retold by each successive generation. In his questioning, he could almost be a patron saint for our own uncertain 20th century. But the Acts of Thomas suggest that there is far more to his story than one understandable act of doubt. And to follow that story, I went to Jerusalem. While Jerusalem is still one of the most beautiful cities in the world, I've always found it one of the most upsetting as you wander the cobbled streets of the old city, it's impossible not to notice the daily humiliations suffered by the indigenous Palestinians, a constant reminder of the unhealed wound at the heart of the Middle East. For the apostles in the days immediately after the crucifixion, Jerusalem must have been a terrifying place. 
neither the Roman occupiers nor the religious authorities would have had much sympathy for the followers of what they saw as a dead revolutionary and heretic. What would it have been like in the very first days of the early church here in Jerusalem? I'd imagine that the few disciples of Jesus would have been a, in a chaotic state. Remember, they, after the resurrection, they finally realized that Jesus was alive as he had promised. I mean, they hadn't really believed what he was saying in his lifetime. And that meant a tremendous surge of energy and courage. And immediately they began to spread out. We had a church in Damascus within 18 months of the resurrection. And the project then was to go from Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria to the ends of the world. What would that early church that St. Thomas knew have been like? I doubt if we would have recognized it, because to us, it would, they would have looked and acted exactly as Jews did. They went to pray in the temple, presumably they offered sacrifice in the temple. They, the difference was is that they confessed Jesus as the Lord. They believed that he was the Messiah, that he had inaugurated the last age of human history. But that was all that separated them from their environment. And St. Thomas's role in that? I imagine that he would have been one of those that went to the east, so we'd lost sight of him. You see, others went as far as Antioch, that was the bridgehead to the west, but we have forgotten in the west all the great missionaries who went to the east. Today, the Palestinian Christians, who with reason can claim descent from the very first Christian communities, have all but disappeared, and their churches are empty. Under Israeli rule, they find themselves second-class citizens in their own land. Those that remain could be flown out in just nine jumbo jets. Only the clergy are left in the Cathedral of St. James, dedicated to the memory of the first head of the church in Jerusalem. That early church would have followed a very particular form of Christianity, one probably unrecognizable to the Western churches today. Yet this was the faith of the apostles who actually knew Jesus in the flesh. And if the manuscript I saw in St. Catherine's was to be believed, it was these forgotten traditions that St. Thomas may have taken with him to the East. There seemed to be only one way, finally, to judge the likelihood of Thomas's legendary journey, to follow in his footsteps, to walk the same roads, to see wherever possible what he had seen, and to discover if any trace of the saint lay at journey's end. As he crossed over the deserts on the way out of Judea, Thomas would have been leaving his homeland forever, where, according to the Acts, he had begun life as a simple carpenter, like Jesus himself. I followed his route in a Palestinian minibus, which managed the journey rather faster than in his day. Then caravans would have plodded their way down past the Dead Sea, and at the end of a week of hard desert travel, have arrived at the Gulf of Aqaba. <laughs> The modern resort of Elat is not one of the more resonant ancient sites in the Middle East. And although you'd never guess it today, this was once the ancient Israelites' port to the outer world, called at Zion Giba. Now, of course, it's more like the Middle East's answer to Ibiza. One of the main stumbling blocks to belief in St. Thomas's journey has always been the sheer geographical problems that seem to be involved. Yet it is easy to forget that from the Red Sea, it is a direct route down the Persian Gulf to India. So if Thomas really did go to the subcontinent, his point of departure could well have been from here. On the face of it, the story told in the Acts of Thomas might seem absurd. Could there really be any genuine historical basis for the legend of Thomas's difficult journey 3,000 miles across the Arabian Sea to a destination that then must have seemed semi-mythical. The answer to those questions could only lie in India itself. St. 
Thomas would have sailed across the Arabian Sea and then followed the trade winds as they took his ship down the length of the Indian coast. It would have been a journey out of the familiar territory and customs of the Eastern Roman Empire to the utterly foreign land of the Indian subcontinent with its very different Hindu civilization. Moreover, its green fertility could not have been a more stark contrast to the desiccated hills of the Judean desert. Finally, the ship would have found its way here into what was once the main port of the Malabar coast, the great deep water inlet of Cranganore, known to the ancients as Moziris. To a simple carpenter from rural Palestine, it must have been like arriving on a foreign planet. stepped ashore, he was not to know that he would spend the next 20 years here preaching the gospel. According to the Acts, as he entered the city, he heard the sound of pipes and organs and much singing. For there were once docks and quaysides on this site, warehouses and the palaces of rich merchants. Here too was a synagogue for the Jews and a temple of Augustus for the expatriate Roman community. It was here, perhaps on the site of these crumbling walls, that St. Thomas is supposed to have erected the first church in India. It's frankly amazing how little is left of Cranganor now. A few old walls and towers, the laterite eroded to the texture of old peach stone and choked with vines and creepers. But 2,000 years ago, this is one of the biggest ports in the entire world. All the spices of Malabar were brought here, oils from the Himalayas, slave girls from northern India, a lot of the silk trade from Central Asia and out here 300 triremes from the Red Sea to buy it. But now all that's left, just a few old walls. At first I could see little evidence that this was the place of his arrival, apart from the St. Thomas canteen and cool bar. But close by there was a small fishing village. The fishermen are mostly Christian and I met with two called rather unexpectedly Peter and Thomas. Thomas. My name's Thomas. Yeah. I'm Peter, and I work as a fisherman on the high seas. St. Thomas was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He came and preached the teaching of Jesus to the local Hindus. When you read in the Gospels about Peter and James being fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, does it all sound very familiar? <laughs> of course it's familiar, and we feel that connection. We feel the connection all the way from Peter. We're proud to be fishermen, and we believe in that connection. It is with that faith that we go out to sea. When the sea gets rough, it's God's name we call. The sea is very unpredictable. You never know whether you'll come back to shore. We pray to God, of course, and to Jesus Christ. We pray to the saints, too. In a storm, to be honest, you don't really have time to think. You just call on everyone. But Christ is the real power. Everyone else is secondary to him, even St. Thomas. They were, after all, his disciples. When we're in need, we pray first to Jesus and only then to St. Thomas. Christ's apostles underwent great hardship to take his word to people right around the world. Here in Kerala, St. Thomas taught people the word of God. According to the fishermen, St. Thomas is supposed to have travelled through the coastal towns and villages of this part of India, today called Kerala. As he went, he began erecting crosses, converting people with the aid of miracles and building churches. To scholars in the West, the question of St. Thomas's journey to India is one of academic debate, if not outright disbelief. But, as I soon learnt in India, it's a tradition which has not only been preserved, but jealously guarded by people who still proudly call themselves the Christians of St. Thomas.
It is in fact more than a legend. It is an article of faith which underpins their whole identity and their place in Indian society. As I took in the intensity of the devotion, I noticed a strange fresco above the doorway of the church. It was a conventional last judgment scene, but there were many strange idiosyncrasies. The devil was made to resemble the Hindu goddess Kali. A Catholic priest was being tortured, and there was a demon in the form of Vishnu. Clearly, if St. Thomas did bring Christianity here, it has survived in a uniquely Indian form. Tradition and a body of legends are one thing, but what hard evidence is there to show that it would have been possible for Thomas to make this epic journey from first century Roman Palestine? These are the Roman ones, look. I went to the local museum to meet up with my friend, the Australian scholar of the spice trade, Dr Jack Turner. Very, very script, some of them. That's right. Look at these keys. It's a fine set he's got there. Have you got that? Well, here I have Augustus, and here I have Nero. Mean-looking guy. Yes, this is, a, this is a very interesting coin because this is one of the earliest coins that they've found in India from the Roman connection. So this would be... What sort of period? Well, roughly datable to about the beginning of this millennium, the time of Christ, the birth of Christ. Did you get much before that or no? No, so it was about the time of Christ that the Greek actually discovered the way of sailing to India by a direct route from the Yemen, and he found that uh, if he hopped on the back of the winter monsoon at the right time of year, he could sail to this coast in about 40 days. 40 days? 40 days to do That's right, across the ocean. But it required a huge leap of faith to sail out onto the blue water into the open ocean. Rather than taking the coast? Without hugging along the coast, which would take months. And what were they buying with this? Mostly pepper. And uh, after pepper, some of the other spices, uh, exotic products such as cinnamon, and nutmeg and cloves, which came from further east. But this was the, the Spice Coast par excellence. This is where all the pepper in the world was produced until the modern era. Pepper's the most boring of all spices. I mean, they're just ordinary pepper. Not for a Roman, no, no, no. It was, it it was, was hot th stuff, was it? Oh, absolutely. In fact, when... Um, it was the Tabasco of its day. Yes, in fact, much, much later after this, Rome was, uh, was sacked by the, by the Goths, King Alaric, and instead of gold, he demanded payment in pepper. But people became rich from this. This was the... Oh, fabulously rich, yes, yes. And, and what do the dates go up to? When's Nero? Well, Nero's in the middle of the first century AD, which is the period which coincides with the most intense um, trade. And this is, this is when we find most of these Roman coins. So they start in the reign of Augustus and they build up under Nero in the middle of the first century AD. We get a... It's so exactly, exactly the time St Thomas would have come if he had come. That's right. In fact, if this is the period when it would have been easiest for St Thomas to come to India. In fact, it would have been easier to sail to India and safer and probably cheaper than at any time for the next 1,500 years. Wow. Until Vasco da Gama sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. So it's perfect timing? Absolutely perfect timing. So the idea isn't absurd from a historical point of view that St Thomas came to India. I mean, he could have come easily. That's right. It doesn't prove anything, but it was certainly possible. I was still surprised that boats could then have survived the monsoon passage from the Middle East. The evidence lay along the shoreline nearby, half hidden in the trees were the rotting hulls of great whales of boats, many of which were designed for precisely such a journey. The skills of the Malabar boat builders were prized for centuries by the medieval Arab spice traders who so valued the combination of Indian craftsmanship and locally available teak that they had many of their finest boats made here. This boatyard still builds traditional ships for Arab merchants, although only just. It was on the point of closing when I went with Jack to have a look at what may well be one of the last boats they ever make. <laughs> this must be a heck of a lot bigger than anything available in St Thomas's time though, yeah? Well, not necessarily. The Greeks had ships of approximately this size. It's a big ship, though, isn't it? This is a big, big ship. A big ship, that's right. Well, the Greeks had ships up to about 600 tonnes, which is about this, I would guess. And, in fact, they had to be of this size for two reasons. Firstly, to survive the oceanic crossing from India to the Arabian Peninsula. 
which involves some quite big seas. And secondly, to take... During, during the monsoon? That's right. And to um, fit the cargo in. Quite a bulky cargo of, on the way out of, of horses and... What you had done that? Horses and slaves, mostly, in the, on the outward journey. And on the way back, they would have had spices and cottons. They actually sold slaves to India? That's right. From the Balkans. Really? And horses? Horses from Arabia, that's right. Very much in demand here. So if St Thomas came on this voyage, he'd be down in that hold with a whole lot of slaves and horses? Forty days and forty nights. Very biblical, down in the hold. Very noxious. It's mind-boggling stuff. And, the, you know, on the pitching seas with the... the horses the get out of their mind. sweat, swilling around, horses crying. It must have been disgusting. This is like one vast lavatory. It would have been like a sewer, and the horses and the sweat and the smell. So just like economy. Absolutely like economy <laughs> class, yes. <laughs> On a particularly nasty long-haul flight. So you, you brought slaves and you shipped back spice? That's right. The spice trade not only provided St Thomas with the means of getting to India, it also provided him with a purpose. The lure of spice meant that there was a thriving expatriate community of Romans and Jews he could try to convert. In the bazaars, one can still see the old method of bargaining being used. The price is agreed by the squeezing of fingers under a towel so that no one else can hold you to the same price. Spice is still the lifeblood of the markets of Kerala, and it is still heavily dominated by the St. Thomas Christians. At the big spice exchange, tempers get a little peppery as the traders bargain in the future of cardamom, nutmeg and ginger. <laughs> Kerala and its main port Cochin have built their fortune on the spices Arab and European gourmets wanted on their tables. For Thomas, this would have been a perfectly logical place to come. Western academics have always been decidedly sceptical about the St. Thomas legend, treating it as little more than pious legend. But the more you examine the evidence, the more you're irresistibly drawn to the conclusion that whether or not St. Thomas did visit India, he certainly could have done. And if there's no final documentary proof to clinch the argument, there is at least a very good reason for its absence. For the entire historical records of the St. Thomas Christians were burnt, not by Muslims or by Hindus, but by a newly arrived power who were themselves, ironically enough, Christian. For the calm world of the Indian Ocean was changed forever when in 1498 Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to the Indies. Soon the Portuguese were shelling the coastal cities of Kerala in an attempt to seize control of the spice trade. The Portuguese Inquisition immediately set about destroying the St. Thomas churches and building their own. For as far as the Portuguese were concerned, the Indian Christians were heretics, who among other things believed in reincarnation and astrology. This cathedral is a monument to the new order the Portuguese imposed, a symbol of the imperial church rising triumphant above the perceived darkness of Indian heresy. On the altarpiece, the angels wear Portuguese clothes, while St. Thomas is shown with European features, wearing the robes of a Catholic bishop. But despite burning all the existing copies of the Acts of Thomas, the Inquisition never completely succeeded in erasing the history of the Indian Christians. It's only when you poke around behind the altarpiece that you can see the older traditions the Portuguese had deliberately tried to cover up. For here, in the darkness, you can still find an image of St. Thomas, but with the dark skin and features of a man from the East. Kerala is crisscrossed by a network of lagoons, rivers and canals known as the backwaters. To see quite how far the St. Thomas Christians have managed to maintain their independence and their traditions, 
you have to travel inland over the lakes and waterways, past a trail of shrines and churches that mark the way St. Thomas himself is supposed to have come. the deep south of India, hot and humid, somnambulant and brooding. The soil is so fertile that as you drift up the lotus-choked waterways, the trees close in around you and twisting tropical fan vaults of bamboo and banyan arch together in the wards of the forest canopy. Mango trees hang heavy over the fishermen's skiffs. All is still and green and fertile. It's here, in the muggy jungles of the interior, that the St. Thomas Christians held out most effectively against the Portuguese. After the burning of their libraries, they had to find a way to preserve their legends and the memories of their past. In songs and dances such as this, the Kalimagan Patu, or Dance of Thomas, the story of how the Apostle brought Christianity to India was kept alive, locked in a place that the Inquisition could never touch the minds and memories of the Christians of the backwaters. So here is a precious thing in which you might be interested in. What is it? This is palm leaf document. Uh, very ancient which contains the ancient songs of the Syrian Christians written. Just what we saw now? The, yeah, yeah. That's, this is the text? Yeah, part of the thing, yeah. Part of the thing. Yeah, this Margin Kali text, and there is the uh, ancient is, songs. Margin Kali yeah. being the, the song of St. Thomas. St. Thomas, yeah. Which is, the, which is the song of St. Thomas? Could you show us the text of that? Yeah, this is yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Oh. But, Father, I thought all this sort of thing, all the documentation was destroyed by the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this type of things survived. How? In the oral tradition? Oral tradition. Passed uh, on from father to son? Son to son, yeah. Teachers to students, you know. And then later, I think this might be of the 14th and the 15th century, they started writing this on this uh, leaf of a coconut, this coconut uh, tree leaf. And these are the oldest surviving documents of the, the St. Thomas Christians? Documents of the St. Thomas Christians, uh, this uh, ancient songs. It turned out that the father had another rather unexpected treat. A troop of dancing nuns. <laughs> See, Marginally is a male dance. Okay. And uh, recently when we introduced it uh, in Kerala for the youth festival, we introduced it also for um, women folk. Okay. Now later, we also introduced among the sisters who are neither male nor female. Oh, that's, a, that's a very polite father. <laughs> They're very feminine nuns. <laughs> so, father, bring on the dancing nuns. I wasn't quite sure what to expect, having never seen nuns dance before, except, of course, for the odd pub strippogram. It wasn't Whoopi Goldberg, but then St. Thomas probably wasn't Rudolf Nureyev either. But Father, isn't it a bit unusual to have nuns dancing? Yeah, they don't generally dance, you know. They must get very hot feet on this hot surface, Father. So it is easy for uh, dancing, you know. Fast they will um, move. Father, they're very cruel to them. <laughs> we left the sisters strutting their stuff and headed on upstream. Until finally, at the end of the backwaters, we came to Katayam, the St. Thomas Christian's capital. I knew it was nearly Christmas. The lulling effect of the backwaters had made me lose track of the date. And I found Katayam in the midst of its Christmas celebrations. All 
I'd seen, I went to bed as I used to as a child on Christmas Eve, scarcely able to wait for the morning. The church service here is like an extraordinary religious time capsule. To this day, the St. Thomas Christians follow the ancient liturgy of St. James, that once used by the early church in Jerusalem, which is still, in part, chanted in Aramaic, the language of both St. Thomas and Jesus himself. What I find even more remarkable is that many also celebrate the Passover meal, a Jewish practice undoubtedly followed by the very earliest disciples of Jesus. The bell staves being rung over the priests are to mimic the feel of angels' wings. Christian presence makes the town feel quite unlike any other in India. For not only is Katayam full of lay Christians, it is also packed with monasteries and seminaries, many of which claim to have been founded by the Apostle himself, and all of which are packed to bursting. And while the churches of Jerusalem and the West are slowly emptying, those in India are flourishing more than ever. So, Father, what would you say to cynical Western scholars mm -hmm. who say that there's no evidence that St. Thomas ever came to India? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, we are the evidence for the coming of St. Thomas to India because we have a very long, unbroken tradition in the community which believes that St. Thomas was the founder of the church in India. And for us, that is the most important thing and not something on paper or um, stone, which is secondary. We have a spirituality which is uh, very close to the spirituality of the early church. We would say we are as old as any apostolic church anywhere in the world. This ceremony is to commemorate the feeding of the 5,000, an event that St. Thomas himself would have witnessed. Yet while the original feeding of the 5,000 admitted everyone, some Christians are rigorously kept away from this celebration. For the converts to the St. Thomas churches retained many of their old Hindu traditions and never forgot their original caste. As I soon discovered, the untouchables, or delites as they now prefer to be called, are very much segregated away from the big church. So what do you teach at the... Uh, I teach huh? English. Yeah? Yeah. Shakespeare and... Ah, it's Malayalam English. <laughs> <laughs> here we are. Yeah, so this is the church. Who worships uh, here? Yeah. The, the Delits. Exclusively the Delits. Exclusive for Delits. And it was uh, established 100 years ago by the upper caste Christians. Not by the Dalits themselves? No, no. So this church was built as an alternative for the yeah, Dalits? Yeah, yeah. Because the people who thought of setting up a congregation for the Dalits, they thought it better to have a separate congregation. Was it done politely or not, offensively? It was not the choice of the people. The people would rather worship together. They would like to have fellowship. They would like to have communion. The Dalits would? Yeah. But the upper caste wouldn't have it. No. And how much of that survives today? I mean, if you, what does it actually mean day to day to be a Dalit? You are always 
made to feel your inferiority. You are made a slave of inferiority, a prisoner of this inferiority. Yeah. How do people know you're a Dalit? I mean, you, you don't wear a badge saying I'm a Dalit. So it's very, very clear, very obvious, and it's very easy for the people to ascertain your caste. The only question uh, needed is where you come from, which place, which locality, and which congregation you belong to. And immediately... Because all the congregations yeah. are segregated. When you read in history books that St. Thomas came to India and converted exclusively the upper castes, what do you, even the Brahmins, the priests, what you know, do you think when you hear that? Personally, I cannot subscribe to that belief or that lie. Uh, because uh, uh, Christ Jesus, he, he uh, chose his disciples from the lowest, the fishermen, the fisherfolk, the ordinary people, the, the people on the margins. How can you? believe that a disciple of Jesus came and chose disciples from the upper caste. So it's, a, it's an upper caste lie? It's misinformation? Uh, yeah, or disinformation. <laughs> Good. Thank you, sir. I went to see Arundhati Roy, the Booker Prize winner who was born here and is herself a St. Thomas Christian. She has strong views on caste. In my book, most people say, how can you say that a Syrian Christian woman and a, paria, a parivan, who's a untouchable, a Dalit, could have had a physical relationship because it's simply not possible. They are two different species. That, that's what they say. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. Since we've been here, we've talked to lots of St. Thomas Christian priests and, and bishops, and they've all said unanimously that caste isn't a problem and doesn't exist in the Christian community. Is that true? I can't believe uh, that uh, they would say that. You know, that's, it's just, there's no polite way of putting it, it's just complete crap. But uh, I, I, I mean, in a strange way, it's, it's encouraging that they even think that it's something to hide because most people, you know, wouldn't deny it because they don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, to the extent where there are people who would not still, to date, allow uh, Dalit person into their kitchen or into their house. A St. Thomas Christian wouldn't allow... Oh, yeah. I mean, you, I mean there, you'd find people that do, but equally you'd find plenty who wouldn't even consider it, you know. They'll say, I have had relatives who've told me, you know, they smell different and things like this. It's, it's barbaric. Talking to Aaron Datty and the professor made me realise how difficult it must have been for St. Thomas himself trying to make converts in so complex and unchanging a country. This is the biggest Christian pilgrimage centre in Kerala. Every day, groups of pilgrims of every caste head up to the top of the hill called Malayatur. They carry wooden crosses and chant hymns to Punan Karisu Mutapan, the old man of the cross, as they call St. Thomas. The reason they do so is that Thomas himself is said to have retreated up this mountain to hide from his Hindu enemies, who had been alarmed at the growing success of his mission. He had now been in the country 20 years. As you rise up the hill, you can see the whole of Kerala laid out like a table before you. After St. Thomas climbed up here, he's said to have spent a month in prayer, preparing for what he knew would be his martyrdom. At the end of this month, he warned his followers that they would never see him again, but promised that he would watch over them forever. He looked out for the last time over the green fields of Kerala, then picked up his staff, and set off eastwards across the mountains and even further into India.
As an 18-year-old backpacker, fresh from school, this was one of the first parts of India that I ever travelled in. And it was here, I suppose, that I first really fell in love with this astonishing, maddening country. Sitting on the running board, looking out over these plains, I remembered that first trip and the degree to which that first glimpse of India thrilled, excited and daunted me. Since then, I've lived here on and off for years, and it has never ceased to surprise me. For Thomas, though, it was a very different journey. He was travelling into what has always been the most orthodox area of Hindu India. For Tamil Nadu, so the Tamils will tell you, is a sacred landscape where Hinduism has been preserved in its purest form, untouched by the influence of Islam that has moulded its character in the north. Certainly, as St. Thomas headed eastwards, he encountered ever more resistance from the Hindu priestly caste, the Brahmins. Madras, the capital of southern India, is a relatively modern city, founded by the British in the late 17th century. But on its edge, now absorbed into the sprawl of the city, lies the far more ancient temple town of Mylapore, the city of peacocks, sacred to the great god Shiva and his son, Murgan. St. Thomas spent four years here, preaching to the people and debating with the Brahmins, who then as now administer the Mylapore temple. But ultimately, the refusal of Thomas to worship the Hindu gods made him enemies. After four years, the local Raja had had enough of this troublesome holy man, converting his subjects and irritating the Brahmins of his temples. So he ordered St. Thomas to be dragged from his cave. Then, as the Acts of Thomas puts it, he took Thomas and went without the city, and there came with him a few soldiers with weapons. He said to the soldiers, go up on this mountain and stab him. And when he had ascended the mountain, St. Thomas went to pray, saying thus, my Lord and my God, my guide in all the lands through which I have travelled. Guide me now that I may come unto thee. Then the soldiers came and struck him altogether, and he fell down and died. In his life, St. Thomas had travelled thousands of miles. But it was after his death that the saint, a carpenter from Roman Palestine, made the strangest journey of all, into the Hindu pantheon. On the face of it, Hinduism, with its thousands of deities, might seem to be an impossibly different religion to Christianity. But what is surprising is that in the centuries after Thomas's death, Christians did visit Hindu temples, and members of the two faiths did successfully live side by side, mingling their beliefs. In many places, Christian images, including those of St. Thomas, were carried in temple processions next to idols of Shiva and Murgan riding on his peacock. It was against this background that Thomas was slowly absorbed into Hindu cosmology, in the somewhat surprising form of the sacred bird of Mylapur. The story of the travels of the Apostle was mingled with Hindu myths, so that St. Thomas was later understood to have met his end while hiding from his enemies in the form of a peacock. Eventually, prompted by a demon, a lower caste huntsman shot and killed him. The myths of the two traditions became so closely intertwined that the audience, depending on their faith, could understand this dance as telling either the death of Morgan or the martyrdom of St. Thomas. It is an extraordinary example of the ability India has always had of absorbing and transforming all the influences that come to it. It's only recently that the close relationship between Hinduism and Christianity has begun to be threatened by vicious attacks on Christians by militant Hindu fundamentalists. But despite such reverses, Christianity survives here, as does the cult of St. Thomas. Hindus and Christians both still come here to pray to the saint for their most profound hopes and desires.
at the end of my journey, I climbed to the top of the hill outside Madras, still known as St. Thomas's Mount. This ancient chapel was built on the site of an even older monastery, marking the place of the saint's martyrdom and visited by Marco Polo. It's a quiet and peaceful place, sanctified by the prayers of generations of pilgrims. In its very smallness, as well as its incredible antiquity, this chapel is an oddly appropriate memorial to St. Thomas. For while Christianity has never been a major faith in India, it is a religion with incredibly deep roots in the soil, and one which has clung on with remarkable tenacity, despite the odds. Above all, the church here has remained faithful to the tradition of St. Thomas's incredible journey from Palestine to southern India, a story long forgotten in a West which has come to regard itself as the home of Christianity, forgetting that Christianity is in its essence not a Western, but an Eastern religion. Sitting in the tiny chapel, it seemed a long way from the start of my journey in the deserts of the Holy Land, where St. Thomas had grown up and where I had stumbled on his story in the pages of the Acts. I couldn't help thinking that for a man who was famous for having been a doubter, it showed a quite extraordinary leap of faith to have traveled quite so far with the seeds of a new religion, and finally, to have given up his life for his beliefs. <laughs> 